Okay, so tonight we're covering Hebrews 10, verses 4 through 25. All right, so starting in verse 4. uh, Talking about how it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And I think we talked about this last time in chapter 9, wasn't it? What did we do last time? Yeah, chapter 9. Uh, We were talking about how in the old covenant system, the sin offerings did not take away the problem of sin. So we'll review that real quick. So under the Old Testament sacrifice system, none of those sin offerings actually forgave sins per se. You know, their hope in the Messiah to come, that faith is what granted them eternal life. All the sin offering did was wash them clean, make them ritually clean clean to remain in the covenant that they were in, to remain as God's people. So all those sacrifices they did, that did nothing to wash away their sin, remove the guilt of sin, didn't do any of those things. The promise of Messiah does those things. All those Old Testament sacrifices did was made them ritually clean to remain in the covenant with God. And that's only if they did it correctly. And that's only if they did it correctly, exactly. Which according to Malachi, they weren't doing it. Uh, yeah, this is true. Yeah, because they have all these rules, right? The rules, and we'll talk about later how the priests had to stand every day. Every day they had to offer sacrifices for their own sins before they could offer their sacrifice for the sins of the people. Uh, day in, day out. And then, of course, on the Day of Atonement, he had even more to do. Okay, so... None of that blood could take away sins. It only allowed them to remain in the covenant. Therefore, when he comes into the world, meaning Christ, he says, and he is quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, and you're going to read in your Bible, you are not going to get the same words that are being quoted here. Because in most of our modern Bibles, the Old Testament is quoted from the Hebrew. That is not what the apostles in Christ are quoting from in the New Testament, and Christ quotes from the book of Psalms more than anything. They are not quoting from the Hebrew. They are quoting from the Septuagint. They are quoting from the Greek Old Testament, which at the time was the oldest known text of the Old Testament. It's older even than the Hebrew copies. Uh, so that's the old, that was the oldest manuscript. So you have to read to get the entire quote uh, especially, but a body you have prepared for me, you are not going to find if you flip to your Old Testament right now and look up Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. It's not going to say the same thing. And that's why. Uh, because that is from the Septuagint. And always in the New Testament, you are always going to see, when you look it up in the Old Testament, then when they quote from Isaiah, whatever, if you go back and look, the words aren't going to match. And you're like, why? Well, it's because it's from different translation. Because the Greek-speaking... Uh, Jews, a lot of them could even read Hebrew, but they could read Greek. Everybody could read Greek. So that's what they're quoting, and that's even what uh, what Christ quotes. So if you read in the Septuagint, Psalm 46, that's exactly what it says. All right, so the blood of animals cannot remove, and you want a Greek word, uh, anul is the Greek word, anulus. So anul, uh, it does not remove sins. Like an annulment of a marriage means it never happened. Okay, so an annulment of sin, the removal of sin, like it never happened. That's not what the sacrifices do. They don't make it like it never happened. It just makes you ritually clean to uh, continue in the covenant. So your conscience remained convicted. So it's only a temporary pardon, basically, right? You are not receiving uh, an annulment. You are not receiving, what, what do they call that when you, legal term. What am I looking for? What a moment. What other? No, 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 no. Legal term like when you receive acquittal. You're not receiving an acquittal. It's only a temporary pardon. But the guilt and the shame of your sin sticks to you. All right? Right. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. So, uh, verse 5 to 7, quote, again from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. Sin requires a death. Because you got to have, this, your sin requires a death. So in this case, the death of the animal does not fix it. And the law doesn't solve the problem. All of these sacrifices are part of the law. You, 
you do these sacrifices according to the law, but that does not remove the problem of sin because the sin of a man requires the death of a man, right? Okay, so our sin requires our death, and we are going to die. We're going to die the second death, first death, second death, second death. First death is when you're baptized and you die, die to yourself. Second death, your physical death. We're all going to go through that physical death, but then we'll be raised as Christ was raised. But you have to die, and then to pay for those sins, you have to, that death has to be accepted as a sacrifice. Okay, so God never intended for that Old Testament, Old Covenant sacrificial system to address our sin. It only made you ritually clean. So God always intended to create a human body through the Spirit for his Son to become incarnate. Okay? So not Greek, but Latin, uh, incarnate, like chili con carne, right? Chili with meat. So incarnate to put on meat. That's literally what that means, put on flesh. So that's what the incarnation is all about. So that was always God's plan from the beginning, which even says the first promise of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15. You know, when I would put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, he will bruise your, you know, you will crush his head, but he will bruise your heel. That's the promise of the Messiah. So Satan's going to bruise his heel, but his feet will crush him. So it was always the plan, always for that human body to be created for the purpose of becoming incarnate to be sacrificed. Okay, so in that body, the Son does the will of the Father, and therefore Christ becomes the sacrifice that pleases the Father by laying down his life and provides that complete solution for sin. Where there was one before the animals, yeah, it's temporary, temporary cleanness. You're getting, you're getting washed clean enough to stay in the family, but only through the death of a man can come the acquittal of men's sins. Right, now we're all the way down into verse 10. All right, and, that's why, and that is why he says sacrifices and offerings, all that, why he didn't desire them, because he doesn't desire them because they don't solve the problem of your sin. They keep you in front of him, but they don't, they don't cure it. So he doesn't take pleasure in them because they're offered according to the law. Right? And Jesus comes and says, Behold, I have come to do your will. All right, so verse 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So that body of flesh that he put on, that sacrifice one time for everyone. Right, so we're made holy. Sanctified means to be made holy by the sacrifice of Christ once for all. We don't offer anything in contribution. The only thing you bring to the table is your belief, and your belief is a gift that you receive. So really the only thing you bring to the table is thanksgiving, which, changing the subject, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, uh, mostly used in Catholic circles anymore, but they call it the Eucharist. Eucharist is a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. That's what it means. So the Eucharist is the thanksgiving. Okay, so we don't offer anything in contribution for any of this sacrifice, only our belief. Nothing is acceptable to God except the death of a man. So either your death, your eternal death, or Christ's death. One or the other is acceptable. God chooses Christ over you. Now, for those who don't believe, no, he does accept the sacrifice of them, their eternal damnation. That is an acceptable circuit. That is an acceptable circuit. That is an acceptable That is an acceptable sacrifice for the life of sin that we lead. Is then we then die and are eternally damned. That is an acceptable payment for that life, or the Son of God. Okay, then we get into the next section. Again, this is you know review of you know verse eleven. Every priest stands daily. That's reinforcing what we've already talked about and the repeated theme throughout Hebrews that we've had, talking about the liturgical service of the old covenant and the priests and the sacrifices. Okay, so 
Again, they can never completely remove your sins, but they can pay a little something to it so that you remain in the covenant. Because that's what the law says. You want to stay in the family, you got to do this. All right, whereas then in verses 12 through 13, but he, Christ, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. So Christ is portrayed here as uh, the language of high priestly language and kingly language, so our great high priest and king enthroned after offering himself as that one-time sacrifice for all sins. So from his conception to his enthronement, all of that is the sacrifice for sin. Yes, he paid his life on the cross, but from his conception, all of that, living that perfect life in your place, all of that together as a unit is his sacrifice, is an offering for our sins. The atonement, yes, the atonement takes place on the cross, but everything from the first promise to his incarnation to his death and resurrection, his ascension, and then his enthronement, all of that is his Father's will. That's all the plan of salvation. Okay, and then verse 14. For by one offering he's perfected for all time those who are sanctified. All right, so we are then perfected then for all time, perfected for liturgical service. Remember, all this language we've been talking about is about the liturgy, the communion, the people gathering for the divine service at the tabernacle, at the temple, the New Testament period at the altar. Uh, We are, remember all that consecration stuff we talked about earlier on, like chapter eight, whatever it was. Okay, so all that stuff for how the priests were consecrated, how the altar was consecrated, you know, how the blood was tossed on the people, how the blood is tossed on the altar. Now we are consecrated priests, meaning we're able to draw near to God in the divine service, and we continue to be sanctified by our continued reception of the means of grace, meaning the word and the sacrament, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So Luther talked often about the the priesthood of all believers, and we'll touch on that now because they maybe don't use those words, but American evangelicals take that, and they take it completely too far. So, yeah, we're all priests. Does that mean we all have the office of the holy ministry? No. That is still a divine call to administer word and sacrament ministry to the people. Uh, Doesn't make us better than anybody. It's just our vocation. That's what we're called in the congregation to do. But as a priest yourself in the same language that we've been seeing in Hebrews means you do not have to go through me offering a sacrifice for your sins so that you can approach God and I can take your prayers to him as your intercessor. Christ is your intercessor. You have to direct access. That's the, the symbolic and the literal meaning of on Good Friday, it is finished. The curtain over the Holy of Holies was torn in two from top to bottom. What does that mean? there is now no barrier between you and the presence of God. Okay, You don't have to go through priests anymore. He doesn't have to go behind that curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement. The Atonement's taken care of for all time. You can approach God directly. There is no middleman. That's what that means. So that's what it means. You are a consecrated priest in as much as you can go talk to God yourself. You don't need anybody else to do it. That's okay. What's Ephesians 2.10 like? This particular version makes it real plain. God planned for us to do good things and to live as he has always wanted us to live. That's why you sent Christ to make us what we are. Yep. Yep. That is one way of taking that verse. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so his once for all sacrifice makes us all accounted as clean because his righteousness is applied to us. Right. So... You don't have to go through a middleman. You don't need anybody. You just have to, you are, you are justified, meaning you are declared not guilty on account of Christ's sacrifice, and you are sanctified, that is, you are declared, you are made holy because Christ's holiness is applied to you directly without, again, any in-between. Okay, and then, then we'll talk more about that in verses 15 to 18. This section is about how we are 
attaining perfection through the single sacrifice to Christ. Uh, it's not complete, but it begins. Okay, so the Holy Spirit testifies for us after saying that, and then this is quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, uh, which I think will actually be pretty close if you want to look. Um, but that part, if it's in all capital letters or it's in sentence poetry, however your version does it, uh, that's what he's quoting. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Uh, so after the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So the preacher, remember this is a sermon, the preacher's preaching, and he recalls this prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, which we also saw in chapter 8, verses 8 to 12. The Holy Spirit bears witness to what Christ has achieved. So this is one of your, if you're looking, ever looking for a proof text about the inspiration of Scripture, this is it, too. So the Holy Spirit bears witness to what Christ has achieved. Therefore, Spirit is, the Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So through the Old Testament, the Spirit bears witness to us. And the prophesied promises are granted to us. God doesn't remember your sins anymore. Okay, after Christ, he doesn't hold it against us. Questions? Anything? Okay, so I remember, you know, that Jeremiah, that's a big guy, I remember your iniquities no more. Uh, you've confessed it, you've been, you've been absolved. God doesn't remember it anymore. It's gone. And after, yeah, after, after Christ's atonement, he doesn't hold that sin against us. He doesn't even remember it. So what was promised through Jeremiah to these Hebrews in Rome who have converted, you know, what they remember of the prophecy of Jeremiah now is being delivered to them in the divine service, being delivered to us in the divine service as we hear God speak to us. How do we hear God speak to us? Through this. Right, so this is how God speaks to us. So we hear the word read when it is read, and it happens when you read it by yourself too, but when it's read in public, in the communion, in the community, among the congregation, the Holy Spirit is at work in it, in its reading as it goes in your ears. Okay? So you hear God speak, and that law is delivered to your heart through your ears. That's when it goes into you and has effect. Yeah, and when there is the forgiveness of sins, there's no longer any offering for sins, so there's nothing. We don't have a sin sacrifice. You know, we don't do that anymore. We don't have to. There's nothing for God to remember. There's nothing for him to punish. There's nothing for him to condemn. To condemn. Therefore, there is no stain on your conscience, which is what the old covenant couldn't do. Your sins could be taken away. You could be temporarily, ritually clean, but that stain of sin was still on her conscience. The old sacrifice system couldn't take that away. Now it does. Now your conscience is wiped clean. Uh, verse 18 is an interesting verse. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. That it, all the commentators say that that is pointing to the year of Jubilee, which is kind of reaching, I think, but it does make sense. If you remember what happens at the year of Jubilee, when there's a jubilee year, you know, they have to let the fields rest and they have, it's a special, you know, it's a special Yom Kippur and everything else. But they also forgive all debts. So if you're an indentured servant, you're not indentured anymore. That's, boom, it's gone. All your debts, public debts are wiped clean. That's the analogy they're making. So it's like every seven years, you're no longer a slave. You're no longer a debt slave. You're free. Well, that was just that. Yeah, that's the way they did it. So all of those all those debts were forgiven, and that's kind of what they're saying here. This is like this that it's that big of a thing. It's not only is this 
you know, it's been taken away, but you're working off the debt. It's like, no, it's gone. It's like it never happened. And they could just go out and create more debt. Yeah, they could. And they would in, in debt themselves again. Yeah. But, yep. And that was for Jews and non-Jews. Like, if you had, you, you, if someone had a debt to you that was a Gentile, that was forgiven too. Which was really rude for their culture. Yeah, that really messed up the economy. Yeah. All right, so in a jubilee year, that's when that happened. Oh, that's Leviticus uh, 25, when they talk about that. All right, so now, that old way is done, right? Christ has atoned for all sins. All that old stuff is over. So now there's a new way, okay? There's a new way, and it's not a static way. It's not a way that's done by things we have to do. It's living and active. Okay. You know, Christ atoning for us, that's living, that's active, it's effective right now. So that's verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, right? Now we can actually walk into the holy of holies. That curtain's not there, figuratively speaking, because of the blood of Christ. Right? A new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, which is talking about the veil in the Holy of Holies, the curtain, all right, which he inaugurated us through his entering the veil, his entering our flesh and, and doing these things. And since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, also Christ, let us with a draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean. So you remember some of the sacrificial system, you know, when uh, the law was first read, when Moses came down with the tablets, right, he put blood on people, sprinkled them with blood. Yeah. And then the priests also, when they consecrated the horns of the altar, they sprinkled blood on it. So that's the sprinkling language. And then... That was the second set of tablets, right? Yeah, after they got the second set of tablets. Right, so that's sprinkled clean from the evil hunters, and then our bodies washed with pure water. And of course, you know about all the ritual washing we talked about. The priests had to wash their bodies, they had to wash their clothes. They had to either you washed it with blood or you washed it with water. Either way, it was all this ritual, and the Greek word for that is baptizo. That's where we get the word baptism, it just means washing. Uh, so now you've done all that, now that all that has been accomplished. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Aha, now we have something to do. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this is an interesting part. All right, so verses 19 through 23 then is a call to worship and confidence. Right? We're secure in the knowledge that Christ gives us access to the holy things that are God-pleasing, all right? He wants us to draw near to him, and he draws us near. He wants us to receive the holy things, all right? No, no more animal sacrifice that only kept you in the covenant. Christ's blood removes all the sin, solves the problem of sin once and for all, okay? Christ's death, his incarnation, his death and resurrection inaugurate the new covenant, you know? Take and drink. This cup is the blood. This cup, is the blood of the New Testament, in my blood. Right, the new covenant in my blood. Right, because when you have covenant, blood has to be shed. Right, and something had to die. Christ is the one that died. So the blood of the covenant. That's the blood you drink. Right. So his resurrect, his life, death, and resurrection inaugurate that covenant. So now the way is open through that veil, seated at the right hand of God. We've seen Jesus installed as our great high priest because the things on earth are a pale mirror, but a mirror of the things in heaven. So the things you do on earth, the consecrating of the priests, the getting them ready for service, to get the holy place ready for service, that is a pale image of the actual thing in heaven that you see, which is the true high priest seated at the right hand of God. And if you want to see what that looks like, uh, Revelation 19 is the picture of the throne room in heaven. Okay? So, Jesus is installed as our high priest in heaven, whom God has set over his house, the church. 
right? The veil was established with the building of the tabernacle and later in the temple. For centuries, right, that veil kept the people out of the most holy place, including the priests, except on one day, right? Because that's where God came down to dwell, upon the mercy seat, upon the ark. And as we already talked about, that curtain was torn in two at the moment Jesus died. And we're told that that veil is now his flesh, or a symbol of his flesh, that veil is. So why does the act of the curtain splitting give us hope? Which we already talked about. So, well, doesn't that... Because somebody had to see it, right? On Good Friday, somebody had to see it so they could write it down. It's like the moment he died, that tore in two. That must have been important to write down then. So why does that give us hope? Because that probably freaked a few people out. Yeah, but now you can approach God, right? There's no barrier. Because not only did he see it happen, he didn't die. The guy that saw the curtain tear, you couldn't even look, you couldn't peep behind that and look, you would die, right? Because you couldn't stand in God's presence. Now that he saw it torn in two, the most holy place exposed, and holy crap, I'm still alive to tell people this happened. Because now there's no barrier. There's literally no barrier between us and him. Okay, so now the preacher is coming to a new point. So he goes, okay, now if you got all that and you accept all that, that you are, Jesus makes you good. He makes you holy and he makes you righteous with God. So since he's done all that, not only should we draw near to get the good things that he wants. But he wants us to draw near, and that's a great phrase too, because the phrase they would have used in Greek in the synagogue, when, because they all spoke Greek, when it says, let us draw near, that's liturgical language. That's not just like, let's all gather. That was an actual liturgical, they would have heard in their liturgy, the call to worship. You know, you got like Muslims singing from a spire or someplace. They would have had this call to worship. Let us now draw near. That would everybody go, Ooh, time for church, because that was the language. Okay. So you had that, that liturgical language. Uh, I lost my place. Yeah. So we should all now draw near to him. Yeah, that helps. Because we have this direct access to God. We have access to the blood of Christ. And we're able to approach what is holy. So we heed that call to worship. Remember again, this is a sermon. And one of the preacher's main themes throughout this sermon has been that life in Christ, Christian life, is centered on the divine service. Centered on the communal gathering Take the gifts that God has to offer. We don't have to go. We get to go because that's where God gives us stuff. And it's the only place he gives us those things. I mean, yeah, you can talk to God anywhere you are. You can read his word anywhere you may be, and the spirit is living and active. But to get the real goods that he has to give to you is to be given in community. You cannot be a solitary Christian. Got to have the church. And that whole part where we can talk about that on another day, but like even our confessions say outside, because the Roman Catholic mantra is outside the church there is no salvation. <gasps> yeah, Lutheran say the same thing. Outside the church there is no salvation. Sorry, it's biblical. This is what they're talking about. The, where, where you get the things that he has to give you, that's the only place you can get it. Now if you're Persecuted, and it's just you and your Bible, and that's all the congregation that's left. Well, your church. That's okay. Uh, yeah. You know, when you finally have two, you make one of you as a pastor. Because <laughs> that's how it works. That is literally how it works. So, yeah, you can point out all the exceptions to the rule. The exceptions are only going to prove the rule. Yeah, it is a community. We're stuck with each other. Because this is where he says and how he says he's going to give us this stuff. All right, so our experience tells us that these things are true. 
and the preacher is going to get us to think about these things, right? So, well, how, do, how does our experience tell us that? Well, we're baptized. The Holy Spirit makes our conscience clean, removes the guilt of sin. We don't have that. We learn, we sit in church and learn. That's why we don't have to feel guilty. We struggle with that, but our experience tells us, okay, yeah, that's actually true. Uh, that old covenant couldn't remove the sin. But we know the feeling of having been sanctified. We understand that feeling. We're not supposed to trust always our feelings, but we, we know what that feels like. Now, for four chapters, the preacher's been explaining doctrine. A lot of doctrine, because he had a lot of doctrinal, doctrinal concerns for this congregation. Uh, because they're getting spongy. All right. He's not like going, oh, hey, all you like Jewish Christians that just formed this church in Rome, you know, here's how to get started. It's established. They're there. They're doing their thing. And he's got concerns for them. That's why he's writing in the letter. That's why he's writing in the sermon. Okay? They're getting spongy about their confession, which was a common occurrence for the Jewish converts, which all the early Christians, first ones, they're, they're Jewish. That's how it got started. And then it went out from Jerusalem and then Gentiles converted. But these guys, they're getting spongy. They've entered into the new covenant by faith because they heard you know, about Christ and they believed. So they came into it by faith, but now they're wondering, well, is this new covenant all there is? Is that sufficient? Is that enough? Because oh, all this whole stuff we had to do, right? And that's a recurrent theme in the New Testament, right? Peter dealt with it, Paul dealt with it. Is okay, well, I don't know, so I'm going to return to some of that old covenant practice, and I'm going to keep doing, I'm going to participate in the sacrifices, right? I'm going to, I'm going to do this. It's a lack of understanding that the new covenant is sufficient. Christ's atonement was sufficient. His sacrifice was sufficient once for all people, for those who believe. So you don't have to go back and do the other stuff. Right. We're not even getting into what you can eat, what you can wear, you know, who you can marry, any of that stuff, right? This is just, is that enough? Was that enough or do I still got to do the other stuff? Do I have to believe in Jesus and still do the other stuff? So they're getting a little, you know, maybe I got to do this. So in chapter 6, if you remember, way back in chapter 6, like 100 years ago when we talked about that, the preacher pointed out that you have the foundation but you're not progressing to a deeper understanding, and that's what they're ta he's talking about. So they had a need for a basic instruction and in doctrine of the faith, for milk, not meat yet. They're only ready for milk. They, they had it, they were good, but then they started questioning, oh, maybe I gotta do this stuff. And you gotta go back to the milk. You gotta go back to the basics. Because um, you had it, um, and you're not... And some people never progress out of that. Some people never progress from the meat, from the milk to the meat stage. Now, does that make them bad? Are they not saved? Yeah, they're saved. You know, they, do they have a deep fundamental understanding of Christian doctrine? No. They believe John 3.16, they're good. Okay, they're good. But there is a danger. And the danger of it is when you only have a milk strength faith and not progressing to let's call it spiritual maturity, for lack of another term. Spiritual maturity is, is understanding that you really, boy, you really are a sinner, no matter how good you think you're getting, how far you progress, I'm still a worthless sinner. Even though I've broken all these other bad habits, guess what, I'm still a useless sinner. That's spiritual maturity. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is understanding, doc, understanding all this stuff about community and making sure you participate in the divine service and making sure you partake of the means of grace and understanding what that gives you. The problem of not progressing to that stage is you start succumbing to the devil's trap, which he only has one. Did God really say? Everything else is just variations on that theme. All right? So we get into, we might get into false worship, where we're not even really worshiping anymore. Uh, you might get into convincing yourselves that to be sure of our justification, to know that I'm right with God, 
I must have something to do. To do. <laughs> okay? So it must be my works are involved. Because that would make sense. Because this doesn't make sense that it's a free gift. I just have to believe it. And hold my belief is a gift too. There's got to be something i got to do. Because if I'm not doing anything, I don't think I'm doing it right. So i got to do something that's convincing ourselves that I have something to do with it. That's false belief. Uh, we can find ourselves following a false god, which is ultimately what the devil loves, is when you're worshiping something that looks like Jesus, he's up there on the cross, you see him, and it's not him you're worshiping. Because you twist it all around to you are worshiping yourself. That's what ultimately will boil down to. You turn something else into God and you're worshiping that. Um, and that fight against Satan is not ours alone to fight. It is our fight. It's not ours alone to fight. And that's what doctrine is for. Doctrine is your defense against falling into that trap. And that is the exhortation to the congregation he is making in that one tiny couple of verses. You know, he is laying it on the line. So be a congregation. Don't just all of us rattle into the building like weebles on Sunday morning and then wobble out like a vibrating football game at the end with no purpose. Stimulate once another to sacrificial works. Oh, wait, you just said works. We don't have to do anything. No, your works don't merit you anything. They don't, you know, they don't, they don't contribute to your salvation, but your works are not for you. They're for other people. So exhort one another to those sacrificial works. That's why that prayer at the end of, of, of the sacrament says what it says, you know, to motivate, to, to, to make, stimulate us in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. And fervent love toward one another is what we do for our neighbor. Right? That's what we thank for that salutary gift to give us the fuel to the ability to love God and the ability to love our neighbor. To encourage one another because we're all going to struggle. We're all going to be discouraged. We're all going to be weak at some point. And when we're discouraged and when we're at our weakest, that's where your church family is supposed to come in. That's when you're supposed to hold each other up. <coughs> How good are we doing that? All right. Because guess what that does? Holding each other up when, you're weak, when they're weak. That's what promotes spiritual growth. That's what promotes you from being a milk drinker to a meat eater. Right? It also moves you away from sin. Because when you're self-centered, it's when you sin all the time. When you're working, when you're working for others, yeah, you, may do, you, you will sin when you do good works. That's why Luther said sin boldly. He didn't mean just go sin boldly. He meant you're going to sin even though you're doing good things, but don't let that stop you from doing good things. So sin boldly. Do those good works. One of his greatest quotes that has been completely taken out of context. So your works for other people move you away from yourself, move you away from sin. So that's how you grow as a Christian is come to church, get the gifts, do stuff for other people. And together, we gather together to hear God's truth, that that is what we're supposed to do. And there's nothing missing. It's perfect. His message is perfect. His messengers, not so much. But the message is perfect. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do that, and we're good. Because I've already made you holy. When I look at you, I only see Jesus. I don't even remember the stuff you did. That's how much I forgave that. So here, I'm going to give you this medicine that's going to give you eternal life, and it's also going to give you the ability to resist sin and go do good stuff. So go do it. Right? So the preacher, verse 25, urges those Hebrew Christians in Rome to not forsake the gathering, as some of the early Christians had. <laughs> so some of the early Christians, yeah, you gather together, and some of the, it's underground, it's illegal. All right? They're gathering together and they're like, mm, eh. And there's a whole host of other problems that went around with it, like people getting drunk, <laughs> coming to church, because they come to church to eat and then they have church and it's a big mess. But that's Paul. Paul deals with that. Okay, or they return, so they're, they're abandoning the gathering. They're returning to Old Covenant doctrine and practice. 
So the question is, what is the importance of gathering as a congregation and building one another up in love? Because the preacher tells us this is especially important as they see the day drawing near. What day is that? The end. The end of what? Well, time for judgment. Right, so the end of days, right? The last day. Well, I mean, church got started. Is that the day drawing near the preacher's talking about? Is it judgment day? Is it another day? Yeah, he's talking about the last day. So it's like, okay, Jesus just descended, and they're ready. I want you to have your eyes on the last day, because he's coming back, just the way you saw him go. That's how you're going to see him coming back. So, so start looking for it. So you live every day like it's hope, every day like it's the last day. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Yeah. So it's oh, like, yeah. So like that's an interesting way to look at, and, and I'm, I'm I'm riffing off some Pastor Fitz said in one of his sermons because it's like you know when you when you when you're stuck on what to do, you look up in the sky because that's how he's coming back the same way he left. So you ask yourself, am I going to do what? What am I going to do? Well, today tomorrow's the last day. What am I going to do? So in that context, is this what I should do? Which meh, I don't know if he made his point. Okay, so it's especially important as we see that day drawing near, the last day is coming. It's more important than ever that we gather to receive the things he has to give us. That seems counterintuitive, right? Because he got, we got time until he comes back. We can get serious about our faith later when, you know, when, we're, when I have kids and I come back to church and it's time for them to get a confirmation or whatever, or I get old or whatever. Then I'll get serious about it because right now I just want to have fun. No one knows the day or hour. But that's the point. That's why it should be every day. Right. So it's every day. You live every day like it's the day tomorrow is coming. Isn't that what I said a ago? Yeah. I was reinforcing it. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, your ability to change yourself as far as motivation goes is dying in beauty. Yeah, but then we will be changed in an instant and we will be as he is. So we don't have to worry about it anymore. We'll be perfect. So all that self-improvement will finally pay off because you will be perfectly improved when the last day comes. It's weird having everybody this close. This is why we said further apart. Mm-hmm. It's in tons. You moved. I know. Well, that's where we're going to stop. For doing. Well, that's the end of chapter 10 for... Well, we haven't gotten to... That's the only part that's in the liturgy, or in the oh. lectionary, so that's why we're only doing the parts of the book that are in the, in the lectionary. Okay, because I was getting into 26 and all, and it looked pretty... Well, yeah, well, we can talk about it for a minute. And we'll do it sends notes. All right, for if we go on sinning willfully after a sin, because this is just talking the counter-argument. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a terrifying expectation of judgment, which the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Wow. That's pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26. Uh, Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. There's those guys again. How much severer, severe is that word? Punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sacrificed and has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so you want to talk about that? That's, in, that's <laughs> cheerful. It just, it's potent. Well, yeah. You know, really... Motivating. And all that is, is saying what we said earlier. Yeah. But. Because a human has to be sacrificed. That can be you, or it can be Christ. Pick. <laughs> pick one. But if you pick you, so you're willful sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth. Well, what, what does that mean? Let's talk about what that means. If you go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What does that mean? That means most people are in trouble. Most people are in trouble. 
Well, okay. Somebody used the C word. Tell me you listen to anything I ever preach. Okay, so if you have no conscience about your sin, oh. okay, if your conscience is not in the least bit tweaked when you sin, that's what they're talking about because you've lost. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. That's where, okay, I know Jesus died for me and I don't care. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm a, I'm it's a, the rejection. It's my life. I'm going to live it like I want. The unforgivable sin. That's the unforgivable sin. Okay. That's what they're talking about. Okay, we go on sinfully. Will, sinning will, <laughs> try that again. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Christ, the, right? yeah, so the, the sacrifice. So, Christ's sacrifice doesn't work unless we believe. Right, because you have, you, you've basically taken the sacrifice to say, I don't want it. This sacrifice doesn't apply to me. Okay. All right? I've received the knowledge of the truth. I'm going to go on sinning willfully. We sin, yeah, we sin willfully. But it means you are doing, you, you don't have the least bit of, conscience that there is a God who is judging anything you do. It's like that, basically you're a sociopath at this point. That's kind of what it's saying. You have no concept of right or wrong. This is you don't care. Where I take that back, that's absolutely not what it's saying. Because a sociopath doesn't know right from wrong. You absolutely know right from wrong and you don't care. It's the choice you make. Right? You've chosen you've chosen death is what he's saying. Okay. All right. So the last day, a fury of fire. You have two main choices in life. You can choose a relationship with God, you can choose a relationship with Satan. Yep. Well, he chooses you, you don't choose him. You choose to not have a relationship with God. You got to be careful on your language. And I know every other evangelical in the country is going to say, well, that doesn't mean, yeah, it does mean that. He chose you. You choose not to have a relationship with him. It's the only choice you can make. The only choice you have is to say no. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that is my intention. Right. But I have to be careful. I always say it. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're heresy. If it's not heresy, you know what I meant. But words mean things. All right, so anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Yeah, that's a tough one. Okay, well. Uh, how much severe punishment? And then, you know, he's talking about the law there. I mean, he's talking about the old covenant there. He's not saying, yes. well, oh, if you're turning aside the law of Moses, well, no. You're saying if you decide you're going to live under the law of Moses, well, you're already, you know, hosed right there. Because on the Testament of two or three witnesses, you can be judged. Well, how much worse is it going to be under this new covenant, Right. When you just trample underfoot the sacrifice that was sacrificed for you to make the greatest it all right, sacrifice, right? The perfect sacrifice you regard as unclean, the blood of the covenant. Which again, right? There's you can't drink blood, you can't eat blood. The life is in the blood. We're going to talk about that either this Sunday or next Sunday. But oh well, Jesus is saying you can drink His blood because that has been made clean because all things are clean. Right, insulted the spirit of grace. Sin against the Holy Spirit insulted the spirit of grace. Interesting way of putting it. But yeah, that's what he's talking about. Okay. And then the rest of the chapter is talking about, you know, like making a spectacle of, you know, the throwing on your sackcloth and ashes and, yeah. and moaning it up to show. It was just the, the 26, 27, 28 that I was into. So yeah. thank you. Yep. Uh, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's pretty harsh, too. And that's quoting uh, Habakkuk, chapter 2. Habakkuk. It's not one we go too often. No. But that's where we'll leave it for this week. Thank you. Okay, so next week, chapter 11, is where it starts. It's where our Hebrew starts getting good. All right, so we're going to talk about Hebrews 11, talking about a people of faith, and we're going to talk about the faith journey. We're going to be back in the Old Testament again, but it's, it's kind of fun to take all those uh, apart and look at them example by example. And then chapter 12 is going to be talking about participating in God's holiness. Now that you have God's holiness applied to you, participating in it. And then we're going to talk about, now that we've heard about this cloud of witnesses, now we're one of them too, and we will talk about that. And then finally in chapter 13, 
we will really start hitting the nail on the head as we wrap up and we talk about the holy life of a holy congregation where the preacher finally ties everything up in a bow. So these next three chapters are really awesome and as the whole book is, but it really gets pointed and it really gets interesting. Uh, not that the whole book wasn't interesting, but it gets really cool from here on out.